Hello and welcome to another episode of the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review. Today I'm en route to Slape Aerofield, Echo Golf Charlie Victor, just north of Shrewsbury. Actually, I think it's Shrewsbury, not Shrewsbury, which is lesson number one on this aerodrome review. Never say that you don't learn anything here on my channel. The Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review is brought to you in association with AOPA UK, the independent voice of general aviation, supporting pilots, aircraft owners and aviation businesses, promoting our interests and defending our rights at government and regulatory level. Slape, the airfield I'm visiting today, is an AOPA corporate member, and I'm proud to be an AOPA member too. If you'd care to join, Flying Reporter followers can get an exclusive 25% discount off new memberships using my dedicated link on your screen now and in the video description. Shawbury Zone, Golf Bravo Mike, India Victor. Request basic service. Sleep is within the Shawbury mats and so your arrival requires some thought, but it's not complicated. Shawbury is a busy helicopter training aerodrome and so it's advisable to contact them for a mats transit if they're open. Off India Victor Roger, your mass penetration is approved not below altitude 2,400 feet and request the aircraft type. Mass penetration approved, not below altitude 2,400 feet, and we're a PA-28 Arrow Golf India Victor. Golf India Victor. Shrewsbury is just seven miles to the south of Slape. It's a medieval market town with a castle, abbey, and hundreds of listed buildings. With our Mats Transit approved, we got a nice view of the town. What a lovely city that is. Really need to go and visit that, to be honest. But having enjoyed a bit of sightseeing, we now need to concentrate because there is one significant gotcha about Slape which you need to be aware of. Now one thing to be careful of joining Slape is that the runway orientation at Shawbury is identical as, as far as I understand it to Slape. Uh, same orientation of both runways and it, it has been known for people to go to the wrong place. They are in close proximity to each other so uh, we will be making, uh, making sure that we uh, don't make that mistake today. I decided to make a standard overhead join at Slate, which is in fact their preferred arrival, except when there are aerobatics, a flying display or a display practice underway. The air ground radio operator should let you know whether anything is going on in the overhead or you can check when you call up to request PPR. Victor descending dead side. Victor, roger. Slape has two medium-sized tarmac runways, 2305 and 3618. We're landing on runway 23 today. All the fixed wing circuits are to the east and southeast. The circuit for 23 is conventional, just avoid the village on the base to final turn. Runway 18 has an offset approach for noise abatement. Copy the Victor, final runway 23 to land. Golf India Victor, Roger, surface wind 260 degrees, 15 knots. Golf India Victor. I found the runway surfaces to be in very good condition. There's a hard taxiway, taxiway Bravo, that leads to the fuel pumps. There's grass parking for visitors, and a small tarmac apron which can be used by disabled pilots and their passengers. From there, there's wheelchair access to the clubhouse and disabled toilet. You can pay your landing fees at reception or by using the AeroPS app. Shropshire Aero Club, which runs the aerodrome, can usually find hangarage for visiting aircraft if the weather is bad, as it was during my visit. 30 knot wind gusts were expected, in fact. There are eight three-point tie-down points if you don't mind your pride and joy being parked outside. So Slape, spelt sleep, but I can assure you it's pronounced Slape. It's a former RAF base that opened in 1943 as a satellite airfield to nearby Whitchurch Heath, now known as Tilstock, uh, seven miles to the northwest of here. It was a base for the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley bombers uh, and a major base for training uh, in the Horsa gliders. 
Now, not long after opening, there was a series of fatal accidents here. Uh, in the early days, five crew were killed in a night training exercise. There was another nighttime accident here where one of the bombers crashed into the tower. That killed three people. Uh, that was in the summer of 1943, again, not long after it opened. Remarkably, they managed to get the tower operational again by the next day. But then just two weeks later, there was another crash, this time a takeoff accident, again involving a bomber. It crashed into the tower again, and this time six people were killed. Legend has it that the tower is now haunted by the victims of those crashes. No sign of ghosts when I visited. The only fright for me was the age of everyone here. George on the air ground is 27, Ben on reception 20, and the manager, Bruce, is just 22. I feel so ancient. So is it true you're the youngest airfield manager in the UK? I think so. I mean, the CAA don't take a survey on it, but I don't know another aerodrome manager who's 22, so... Uh, How did that come about then? I learned to fly here. I actually started flying here when I was really young. So I've been a member here my entire life and then was on the board of directors um, as a volunteer for a few years. And then um, the previous manager left and then it just all fell into place. Started working here and then worked my way up and now run it um, purely by accident. You have a very youthful staff as well. Yeah. Uh, and what does that mean for the place, do you think? Just, does that change it? Does it make it any different from yeah. other places? Yeah, it, it, it makes it very different because we've got a lot of enthusiasm and energy which can be channeled towards giving a really good customer experience. And also it means everyone who works here, we have a quite small team and they're all good mates and they all gel and bond, which means we, we work really efficiently as a, as a team. Do, do oldies like me find it difficult coming here then, do you I think? Don't, I don't think so. We, we are conscious of that, but I, I, I really don't think that's a problem. We've got 550 members. Um, the average age is about 50. Uh, and everyone raves about the place, so I don't, I don't think so. Um, and you've got a lot going on here, I noticed, from just reading your entry in the Poolies Guide. Yeah. You know, you've got aeros, you've got apparently gliding, and, yeah. also, and you've got helicopter training to the west of the field. So, mm -hmm. you know, how complex is it here? I mean, when I came in, it was a piece of cake. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it always is a piece of cake. <laughs> but it, there is a lot going on. Mm. But because we've got such a large space and we've got such open airspace, it, it all works together really well. A lot of places down south are a lot congested with a lot of airspace above and below and all the rest of it. Because we've got lots of space to work, all the all the stuff that goes on runs really smoothly. Predominantly it's fixed wing stuff that we've got going on here. We don't really have much helicopter stuff. We have a few helicopters based here, but it's predominantly fixed wing. Um, we've got gliding, which keeps itself to itself. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on, but it, it works well. So being a fixed wing pilot, when you see um gliders on the chart, you avoid them. That's what we're trained to do, right? Yeah. Avoid those cables. And so when you hear that gliding is happening at an airfield, you're going to be cautious. So what do pilots need to know about the glider operations here? How frequently do they occur? Where does it occur? Frequently, not, not that often. Predominantly on bank holiday weekends, there's only so many of those uh, a year. So, uh, so it's not that, it's not every day. Um, and they base themselves on the disused runway. So they're actually completely clear of the runway once they've landed mm. and then they use the active to take off so that's an aero tow so it's like any other airplane taken mm. off and then disappear off to the west there's a really good wave over the welsh hills they disappear off there and then when they come back they join for a right hand circuit and they announce themselves as a glider obviously they have priority but um, they they fit in with the traffic really well and the guy in the tower helps uh, work the traffic around and aerobatics i noticed that you're licensed for certain aerobatics here, yeah. aren't you? Um, unusually, I don't think there are many places that have No, no, we've got a, quite a big aerobatic scene here. Um, we hold the national and unlimited championships as well for mm. British aerobatics, where uh, all, the, all the best from around the UK and Europe compete. We also have a display practice box, which not a lot of airfields have, so you can practice display flying down to your display minimum, which is like 100 feet or whatever. Um, so, so there's a lot of aerobatic and display flying going on with pre-described boxes. Normally, if it's in the overhead, you just join downwind um, and it, it works fine. The aerobatic traffic's very used to it and we have spotters that are designed to keep everyone safe. In terms of gotchas for people coming in, obviously you've got the Shawbury zone right off to the east of you here. Yeah. Another gotcha that I noticed coming uh, flying here before is the view that you get from the, the, the Bravo hold yeah. over there. Because you've got the, you're right at the intersection. Yeah. And I, I've sat there for 
two or three minutes trying to work out which runway I want to go it is, down. It is. It's quite a flat airfield, mm. so and it's quite a big airfield. We've got about 400 acres, and um, the runways are pretty wide and they're pretty big and they look kind of similar. And the intersection for the taxiway and the two runways all meet at the same point. So there's like about six different places to go. Mm. Um, once you're based here, it's, it's obviously a piece of cake. But there's Bravo signs, just follow the signs for, for taxiway Bravo. And then be familiar that 2305 is the really wide runway, and 1836 is the little one. What's the vibe and the ethos that you're trying to create here? Good, yes. We're all about being super friendly and super relaxed and just having a, a good time. Flying in GA is meant to be fun. It shouldn't be made out to be this hideously complicated commercial thing. It's all about having fun. That's what we do here. We teach people to fly, we like people visiting, and we just want everyone to have a good time when they come and a safe time. There's a healthy mix of aviation you can commit to here at Slape, and the airfield seems to have more hangars than I've seen anywhere else, 60 in total, with 137 based aircraft from King Airs to Microlites. In terms of training, you can take tailwheel lessons in this Aviat Husky from Jigsaw Aviation Limited. This Husky is the basic training model with a fixed pitch propeller and a 160 horsepower engine. Avalanche Aviation teach aerobatics in their ex-military trainer, the Mark II Slingsby Firefly. They do the AOPA basic and standard aerobatic ratings, but can also do experienced flights for non-pilots who want to see what it's like to go upside down and pull some Gs. Shropshire Aero Club offers fixed wing PPL and LAPL courses in a fleet of typical training aeroplanes, which are all equipped with modern avionics. And you can even take a ride in a 1950s Avro Anson, Yak-11 or North American T-28 with the company Fly the Dream. It was winter when I visited their hangar and so the aircraft were undergoing their scheduled maintenance. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, Slape was a major training base for the Horsa gliders and the cafe here is named after them in some way, shape or form because of course the Horsa gliders were uh, essential for the capture of the Pegasus Bridge in World War II. The cafe is named the Pegasus Cafe. Uh, looking at the menu, they've got a very wide selection of breakfasts from the chocks away, which I imagine is looking at the list of ingredients, the full English and then some. You've got veggie breakfast, you've got um, smoked Scottish salmon with eggs and um, some toast. Um, American pancakes with bacon and maple, maple syrup, Biggles butties, uh, smashed avocado on toast, eggs benedicts and toast with whatever you want on it pretty much. So actually that's a really, that's a really good range of breakfasts and given that whenever we go anywhere we always have the breakfast don't we? But we don't have to have the breakfast, they've got a specials board which has got soup of the day which I think I'm going to go for simply because I had a large breakfast. Um, there's bacon brie and cranberry toasty, Scandinavian smoked salmon tartare, egg fungi which is mushrooms, poached eggs and hollandaise and steak and ale pie as well. So quite an ambitious selection of food here. Good. One thing to note is that the cafe is not easily accessible for disabled people. There's no lift and it's up a flight of stairs. But they do serve food in the picnic area outside in the summer season and they will bring food down for disabled people to eat in the pilot's lounge next to reception on the ground floor. Look who joined me for lunch. Look who it is. <laughs> You need no introduction, really, do you? Simon Keeling from Aviation Weather School will often come and see me if I'm up this way. <laughs> There's a museum at Slate which is far bigger than it looks from the outside. It's usually open during the weekends from May to October. It's operated by the Wartime Aircraft Recovery Group, which is a group of volunteers who investigate crash sites and recover artefacts as a memorial to the pilots who gave their lives operating in the area during World War II. You'll find a number of aero engines, engine parts, and a reconstruction of an airfield flight office. This engine is from a P-47 Thunderbolt fighter that crashed after a mid-air collision with another P-47 over Tiburton in September 1944. The American pilots of both aircraft were killed. This engine is from a Spitfire that crashed in a mid-air collision over Hinks Plantation near Newport in a training exercise in the summer of 1943. Its Belgian pilot was also killed. 
Admission to the museum is free, but since it's run by volunteers, it's best to call ahead to check if it's open if you're coming here especially to visit. Now, there's one thing that's almost certainly increased the popularity of Slape, and that is the price of fuel. Believe it or not, there is currently more than a 50 pence per litre difference between what I last paid to fill up with fuel elsewhere and what they're charging here. It's no wonder that pilots are coming here. The aerodrome says it's open all hours for arrivals and departures, so long as PPR has been obtained. They can leave the lights on for you, and with fuel from a self-service pump, it's a very convenient place to stop and fill up. Members of Shropshire Aero Club also get a 10 pence per litre fuel discount. Before we wrap up, let's talk about the local area and getting about. Shrewsbury is just a half hour taxi trip away. It'll cost you somewhere between 15 and 30 pounds each way. If you want a taxi though, you'll need to book in advance. Like with many aerodromes here at Slape, onward travel can be a bit of a mission, I'm told. There's no public transport to speak of. They're a friendly bunch though, and I'm sure if you're stuck, there'll be someone that can give you a lift. The nearby hotel is a Premier Inn about three miles away. You can't go far wrong with a Premier Inn in my experience. The rooms are usually of a consistent standard and the food in the neighbouring pub here was actually very good. I found the staff to be hardworking and cheerful too. Now Slape, a bit like the wind today, has got quite a bit of energy to it. And I think that can be put down to the age of the manager and his staff. And I think most, if not all of the staff are pilots as well. And so that helps to make the place pilot friendly. So that concludes my video review of Slape. If you've visited Slape and have any comments to add, then do put them in the video comments. I'm also compiling a directory uh, of the airfields that I've done video reviews for. I'm gonna get blown away in a minute video reviews of. That's on my website. There's also a map view so you can look around the country at the places I visited and take inspiration. And if you're an airfield uh, operator or manager and would like me to come and visit your airfield, then do get in touch through my website. Thank you for watching the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review, brought to you in association with AOPA UK. Use the on-screen link or the link in the video description to get an exclusive 25% discount off a new AOPA UK membership now. Until next time, fly safely my friends.